Chapter 18. Annabeth Does Obedience School We stood in the shadows of Valencia Boulevard, looking up at gold letters etched in black marble, DOA Recording Studios. Underneath, stenciled on the glass doors, no solicitors, no loitering, no living. It was almost midnight, but the lobby was brightly lit and full of people. Behind the security desk sat a tough-looking guard with sunglasses and an earpiece. I turned to my friend. OK, you remember the plan? The plan, Grover gulped. Uh, yeah, I love the plan. Annabeth said, what happens if the plan doesn't work? Don't think negative. Right, she said, we're entering the land of the dead and I shouldn't think negative. I took the pearls out of my pocket, the three milky spheres the Nyaride had given me in Santa Monica. They didn't seem like much of a backup in case something went wrong. Annabeth put her hand on my shoulder. I'm sorry, Percy, you're right, we'll make it. It'll be fine. She gave Grover a nudge. Oh, right, he chimed in. Uh, we got this far. We'll, we'll find the master bolt and save your mum. No problem. I looked at them both and felt really grateful. Only a few minutes before, I'd almost got them stretched, stretched to death on deluxe waterbeds, and now they were trying to be brave for my sake, trying to make me feel better. I slipped the pearls back in my pocket. Let's whoop some underworld butt. We walked inside the DOA lobby. Muzak played softly on hidden speakers. The carpet and walls were steel grey. Pencil cactuses grew in the corners like skeleton hands. The furniture was black leather and every seat was taken. There were people sitting on couches, people standing up, people staring out of the windows or waiting for the elevator. Nobody moved or talked or did much of anything. Out of the corner of my eye, I could see them all just fine, but if I focused on any of them, in particular, they looked, started looking transparent. I could see right through their bodies. The security guard's desk was a raised podium, so we had to look up at him. He was tall and elegant, with chocolate-coloured skin and bleached blonde hair, shaved military style. He wore tortoiseshell shades and a silk Italian suit that matched his hair. A black rose was pinned to his lapel under a silver name tag. I read the name tag and then looked at him in bewilderment. Your name is Chiron? He looked across the desk. I couldn't see anything in his glasses, glasses except my own reflection, but his smile was sweet and cold, like a python's, right before it eats you. What a precious young lad! He had a strange accent, British maybe, but also as if he had learned English as a second language. Tell me, mate, do I look like a centaur? Uh, no, sir, he added smoothly. Sir, I said. He pinched the name tag and ran his finger under the letters. Can you read this, mate? It says, Caron. Say it with me. Caron. Uh, Caron. Amazing. Now, Mr. Caron? Mr. Caron, I said. Well done. He sat back. I hate being confused with that old horseman. And now, how may I help your little dead, you little dead ones? His question caught in my stomach like a fast ball. I looked at Annabeth for support. Uh, we want to go to the underworld, she said. Caron's mouth twitched. Well, that's refreshing. It is, she asked. Straightforward and honest. No screaming. No, there must be a mistake, Mr. Caron. He looked us over. How did you die then? I nudged Grover. Oh, he said, I I'm drowned in, in the bathtub. All three of you? Caron asked. We nodded. Big bathtub? Caron looked mildly impressed. I don't suppose you have coins for passage. Normally with adults, you see, I could charge you American Express or add the ferry piece to your last cable bill, but with children, alas, you never die prepared. Suppose you'll have to take a seat for a few centuries. Oh, but, but we have coins. I set three golden drachmas on the counter, part of the stash I'd found in Krusty's office desk. Well now, Caron moistened his lips. Real drachmas. Real golden drachmas. I haven't seen these in... His fingers hovered greedily over the coins. We were so close. Then Caron looked at me. That old cold stare behind his glasses seemed to bore a hole through my chest. Here now, he said. You couldn't read my name correctly. Are you dyslexic, lad? No, I said. I'm dead. Caron leaned forward and took a sniff. You're not dead. I should have known. You're a godling. We have to get to the underworld, I insisted. Caron made a growling sound deep in his throat. Immediately, all the people in the waiting room got up and started pacing, agitated, lighting cigarettes, running hands through their hair, or checking their wristwatches. Leave while you can, Caron told us. I'll just take these and forget I saw you. He started to go for the coins, but I snatched them back. No service, no tip. I tried to sound braver than I felt. Caron growled again, a deep, blood-chilling sound. The spirits of the dead started pounding on the elevator doors. It's a shame, too, I sighed. We had more to offer. I held up the entire bag from Krusty's stash. I took out a fistful of drachmas and let the coins spill through my fingers. 
Charon's growl changed into something more like a lion's purr. Do you think I can be bought, Godling? Hey, just out of curiosity, uh, how much have you got there? A lot, I said. I bet Hades doesn't pay you well enough for such hard work. Oh, you don't know the half of it. How would you like to babysit these spirits all day? Always. Please don't let me be dead, or please let me cross for free. I haven't had a pay rise in three thousand years. Do you imagine suits like this come cheap? You deserve better, I agreed. A little appreciation, respect, good pay. With each word, I stacked another gold coin on the counter. Caron glanced down at his silk Italian jacket, as if imagining himself in something even better. I must say, lad, you're making some sense now, just a little. I stacked another few coins. I could mention a pay rise while I'm talking to Hades. He sighed. The boat's almost full anyway. I might as well add you three and be off. He stood, scooped up our money and said, Come along. We pushed through the crowd of waiting spirits who started gra grabbing at our clothes like the wind, their voices whispering things I couldn't make out. Charon shoved them out of the way, grumbling, Freeloaders. He escorted us into the elevator, which was already crowded with souls of the dead, each one holding a green boarding pass. Charon grabbed two spirits who were trying to get on with us and pushed them back into the lobby. Right, now, no one gets any ideas while I'm gone, he announced to the waiting room. And if anyone moves the dial off my easy listening station again, I'll make sure you're here for another thousand years, understand? He shut the doors. He put a key card into a slot in the elevator panel and we started to descend. What happens to the spirits waiting in the lobby? Annabeth asked. Nothing, Charon said. For how long? Forever, or until I'm feeling generous. Oh, she said. That's, uh, that's fair. Charon raised an eyebrow. Whoever said death was fair, young miss. Wait until it's your turn. You'll die soon enough. Where you're going? We'll get out alive, I said. Ha <laughs> ha! I got a sudden dizzy feeling. We weren't going down anymore, but forward. The air turned misty. Spirits around me started changing shape. Their modern clothes flickered, turned into grey hooded robes. The floor of the elevator began swaying. I blinked hard. When I opened my eyes, Charon's creamy Italian suit had been replaced by a long black robe. His tortoiseshell glasses were gone. Where his eyes should have been were empty sockets, like Ares' eyes, except Charon's were totally dark, full of night and death and despair. He saw me looking and said, Well, nothing, I managed. I thought he was grinning, but that wasn't it. The flesh of his face was becoming transparent, letting me see straight through to his skull. The floor kept swaying. Grover said, I think I'm getting seasick. When I blinked again, the elevator wasn't an elevator anymore. We were standing in a wooden barge. Charon was poling us across a dark, oily river, swirling with bones, dead fish and other stranger things, plastic dolls, crushed carnations, soggy diplomas with gilt edges. The river sticks, Annabeth murmured. It's so polluted, Charon said. For thousands of years, you humans have been throwing in everything you can come across. Hopes, dreams, wishes that never come true. Irresponsible waste management, if you ask me. Mist curled off the filthy water. Above us, almost lost in the gloom, were a ceiling of stalactites. Ahead, the far shore glimmered with greenish light, the colour of poison. Panic closed up my throat. What was I doing here? These people around me, they were dead. Annabeth grabbed hold of my hand. Under normal circumstances, this would have embarrassed me, but I understood how she felt. She wanted reassurance that somebody else was alive on this boat. I found myself muttering a prayer, though I wasn't quite sure who I was praying to. Down here, only one god mattered, and he was the one I had come to confront. The shoreline of the underworld came into view. Craggy rocks and black volcanic sand stretched inland about 50 metres to the base of a high stone wall, which marched off in either direction as far as we could see. A sound came from somewhere nearby in the green gloom, echoing off the stones, the howl of a large animal. Old free faces hungry, Charon said. His smile turned skeletal in the greenish light. Bad luck for you, godlings. The bottom of our boat slid into the black sand. The dead began to disembark. A woman holding a little girl's hand. An old man and an old woman hobbling along arm in arm. A boy, who no older than I was, shuffling silently along in his grey robe. Charon said, I'd wish you luck, mate, but there isn't any down here. Mind you, don't forget to mention my pay rise. He counted our golden coins into his pouch and then took up his pole. He warbled something that sounded like a Barry Manilow song as he ferried the empty barge back across the river. We followed the spirits up a well-worn path. I'm not sure what I was expecting, pearly gates or a big black portcullis or something, but the entrance to the underworld looked like a cross between airport security and the Jersey Turnpike. There were three separate entrances under one huge black archway that said, You are now entering Erebus. 
Each entrance had a pass-through metal detector mounted with security cameras. Beyond this were toll booths, manned by black-robed ghouls like Charon. The howling of the hungry animal was really loud now, but I couldn't see where it was coming from. The free-headed dog, Cerberus, who was supposed to guard Hades' door, was nowhere to be seen. The dead queued up in three lines, two marked attendant on duty and one marked Ez Def. The Ez Def line, or EZ Def, was moving right along. The other two were crawling. What do you figure? I asked Annabeth. The fast line must go straight to Asphodel, she said. No contest. They don't want to risk judgment from the court because it might go against them. There's a court for dead people. Yeah, three judges. They switch around who sits on the bench. King Minos, Thomas Jefferson, Shakespeare, people like that. Sometimes they look at life and decide that person needs a special reward. The fields of Elysium. Sometimes they decide on punishment. But most people, well, they just lived. Nothing special, good or bad. So they go to the fields of Asphodel. And do what? Grover said, imagine standing in a wheat field in Kansas forever. Harsh, I said. Not as harsh as that, Grover muttered. Look. A couple of black-robed ghouls had pulled aside one spirit and were frisking him at the security desk. The face of the dead man looked vaguely familiar. He's that preacher who made the news, remember? Grover asked. Oh yeah, I did remember now. We'd seen him on TV a couple of times at the Yancey Academy dorm. He was this annoying tra televangelist from upstate New York who'd raised millions of dollars for orphanages and then got caught spending the money on stuff for his mansion like gold-plated toilet seats and an indoor putt-putt golf course. He died in a police chase when his Lamborghini for the Lord went off a cliff. I said, what are they doing to him? Special punishment from Hades, Grover guessed. The really bad people get this personal attention as soon as they arrive. The foo, the kindly ones, well, well, they set up an internal torture for them. The thought of this, the Furies, made me shudder. I realised I was in their home territory now, Old Mrs. Dodds would be licking her lips with anticipation. But if he's a preacher, I said, and he believes in a different hell. Grover shrugged. Who says he's seeing this place the way we're seeing it? Humans see what they want to see. They're very stubborn. Uh, persistent that way. We got closer to the gates. The howling was so loud now, it shook the ground at my feet, but I still couldn't figure out where it was coming from. Then about 15 metres in front of us, the green mist shimmered, standing just where the pa pa path split into three lanes was an enormous shadowy monster. I hadn't seen it before because it was half transparent, like the dead, until it moved. It blended with whatever was behind it, only its eyes and teeth looked solid, and it was staring straight at me. My jaw hung open. All I could think to say was, he's a Rottweiler. I'd always imagined Cerberus was a big black mastiff, but he was obviously a a purebred Rottweiler, except, of course, that he was twice the size of a woolly mammoth, mostly invisible and had three heads. The dead walked right up to him. No fear at all. The attendant on duty lines parted on either side of them. The Esdef spirits walked right between his front paws and under his belly, which they could do without even crouching. I'm starting to see him better, I muttered. Why is that? I think, Annabeth moistened her lips, I'm afraid it's because we're getting closer to being dead. The dog's middle head craned towards us. It sniffed the air and growled. It can smell the living, I said. But that's okay, Grover said, trembling next to me, because we have a plan. Right, Annabeth said. I'd never heard her voice quite, sound quite so small. A plan. We moved towards the monster. The middle head snarled at us and then barked so loud my eyeballs rattled. Can you understand it? I asked Grover. Oh yeah, he said. I can understand it. What's it saying? don't think humans have a four-letter word that translates exactly. I took the big stick out of my backpack, a bedpost I'd broken off crusty safari deluxe floor model. I held it up and tried to channel happy dog thoughts towards Cerberus. Alpo commercials, cute little puppies, fire hydrants. I tried to smile like I wasn't about to die. Hey, big fella, I called up. I bet they don't play with you much. <coughs> Good boy, I said weakly. I waved the stick. The dog's middle head followed the movement. The other two heads trained their eyes on me, completely ignoring the spirits. I had Cerberus's undivided attention. I wasn't sure that was a good thing. Fetch! I threw the stick into the gloom. A good solid throw. I heard it go kusploosh into the river sticks. Cerberus glared at me, unimpressed. His eyes were baleful and cold. So much for the plan. Cerberus was now making a new kind of growl, deeper down in, three, in his free throats. Um, Grover said... A uh, Percy? Yeah. I just thought you'd, you'd want to know. Yeah? Cerberus, he's a, 
He's saying we've got 10 seconds to pray to the God of our choice. After that, well, he's hungry. Wait, Annabeth said. She started rifling through her pack. Uh-oh, I thought. Five seconds, Grover said. Do we run now? Annabeth produced a red rubber ball the size of a grapefruit. It was labelled Waterland, Denver, Co. Before I could stop her, she raised the ball and marched straight up to Cerberus. She shouted, See the ball? You want the ball, Cerberus? Sir, sit. Cerberus looked as stunned as we were. All three of his heads cocked sideways, six nostrils dilated. Sit, Annabeth called again. I was sure that any moment she would become the world's largest milk-bone dog biscuit. But instead, Cerberus licked his three sets of lips, shifted on his haunches and sat, immediately crushing a dozen spirits who'd been passing underneath him in the Ez death line. The spirits made muffled hisses as they dissipated, like the air let out of tyres. Annabeth said, Good boy. She threw Cerberus the ball. He caught it in his middle mouth. It was barely big enough for him to chew, and the other head started snapping at the middle, trying to get the new toy. Drop it, Annabeth ordered. Cerberus's heads stopped fighting and looked at her. The ball was wedged between two of his teeth like a tiny piece of gum. He made a loud, scary whimper and then dropped the ball, now slimy and bitter nearly in half, at Annabeth's feet. Good boy. She picked up the ball, ignoring the monster spit all over it. She turned towards us. Go now. Es deaf line. It's faster. I said, but now, she ordered, in the same tone she was using to the dog. Grover and I inched forward warily. Cerberus started to growl. Stay, Annabeth ordered the monster. If you want the ball, stay. Cerberus whimpered, but he stayed where he was. What about you? I asked Annabeth as we passed her. I know what I'm doing, Percy, she muttered. At least, I'm pretty sure. Grover and I walked between the monster's legs. Please, Annabeth, I pray, don't tell him to sit again. We made it through. Cerberus wasn't any less scary looking from the back. Annabeth said, good dog. She held up the tattered red ball and probably came to the same conclusion I did. If she rewarded Cerberus, there'd be nothing left for another trick. She threw the ball away. The monster's left mouth immediately snatched it up, only to be attacked by the middle head, while the right head moaned in protest. While the monster was distracted, Annabeth walked briskly under its belly and joined us at the metal detector. How did you do that? I asked her, amazed. Obedience school, she said breathless breathlessly, and I was surprised to see there were tears in her eyes. When I was little, at my dad's house, we had a Doberman. Never mind that, Grover said, tugging at my shirt. Come on. We were about to bolt through the Ez Def line when Cerberus moaned pitifully from all three mouths. Annabeth stopped. She turned to face the dog, which had done a 180 to look at us. Cerberus panted expectantly, the tiny red ball in pieces in a puddle of drool at his feet. Good boy, Annabeth said, but her voice sounded melancholy and uncertain. The monster's head turned sideways, as if worried about her. I'll bring you another ball soon, Annabeth promised faintly. Would you like that? The monster whimpered. I didn't need to speak dog to know Cerberus was still waiting for the ball. Good dog, I'll come visit you soon. I, I promise. Annabeth turned to us. Let's go. Grover and I pushed through the metal detector, which immediately screamed and set off flashing red lights. Unauthorised possessions. Magic detected. Cerberus started to bark. We burst through the Esdef gate, which started even more alarms bla blaring, and race, raced into the underworld. A few minutes later, we were hiding, out of breath, in the rotten trunk of an immense black tree, as security ghouls scuttled past, yelling for backup from the Furies. Grover murmured, Well, Percy, what have we learned today? That three-headed dogs prefer red rubber balls over sticks. No, Grover told me, we've learned that your plans really, really bite. I wasn't sure about that. I thought maybe Annabeth and I had both had the right idea. Even here in the underworld, everybody, even monsters, needed a little attention once in a while. I thought about that as we waited for the ghouls to pass. I pretended not to see Annabeth wipe a tear from her cheek as she listened to the mournful keening of Cerberus in the distance, longing for his new friend. Chapter 19. We find out the truth, sort of. Imagine the largest concert crowd you've ever seen, a football field packed with a million fans. Now imagine a field a million times that big, packed with people, and imagine the electricity has gone out, and there is no noise, no light, no beach ball bouncing around over the crowd. Something tragic has happened backstage. Whispering masses of people are just milling around in the shadows, waiting for the concert that will never start. If you can picture that, you have a pretty good idea what the fields of Asphodel looked like. The black grass had been trampled by eons of dead feet, a warm, moist wind blew like the breath of a swamp. Black trees, Grover told me they were poplars, grew in clumps here and there. 
The cavern ceiling was so high above us, it might have been a bank of storm clouds except for the stalactites, which glowed faint grey and looked wickedly pointed. I tried not to imagine they'd fall on us at any moment, but dotted around the fields were several that had fallen and impaled themselves in the black grass. I guess the dead didn't have to worry about little hazards like being speared by stalactites the size of booster rockets. Annabeth, Grover and I tried to blend into the crowd, keeping an eye out for security ghouls. I couldn't help looking for familiar faces among the spirits of Asphodel, but the dead are hard to look at. Their faces shimmer. They all look slightly angry or confused. They will come up to you and speak, but their voices sound like chatter, like bats twittering. Once they realise you can't understand them, they frown and move away. The dead aren't scary. They're just sad. We crept along, following the line of new arrivals that snaked from the main gates towards a black tented pavilion with a banner that read, Judgments for Elysium and Eternal Damnation. Welcome, newly deceased. Out the back of the tent came two much smaller lines. To the left, spirits flanked by security ghouls were marched down a rocky path towards the fields of punishment, which glowed and smoked in the distance, a vast cracked wasteland with rivers of lava and minefields and miles of barbed wire separating the different torture areas. Even from far away, I could see people being chased by hellhounds, burned at the stake, forced to run naked through cactus patches or listen to opera music. I could just make out a tiny hill with the ant-sized figure of Sisyphus struggling to move his boulder to the top. And I saw worse tortures too, things I don't want to describe. The line coming from the right side of the Judgment Pavilion was much better. The one that let this one led down towards a small valley surrounded by walls, a gated community, which seemed to be the only happy part of the underworld. Beyond the security gate were neighbourhoods of beautiful houses from every time period in history, Roman villas and medieval castles and Victorian mansions. Silver and gold flowers bloomed on the lawns. The grass rippled in rainbow colours. I could hear laughter and smell barbecue cooking. Elysium. In the middle of the valley was a glittering blue lake, with three small islands like a vacation resort in the Bahamas, the Isles of the Blessed. For people who had chosen to be reborn three times, and three times achieved Elysium, immediately I knew that's where I wanted to go when I died. That's what it's all about, Annabeth said, like she was reading my thoughts. That's the place for heroes. But I thought of how few people there were in Elysium, how tiny it was compared to Asphodel or even Punishment. So few people did good in their lives. It was depressing. We left the Judgment Pavilion and moved deeper into Asphodel. It got darker. The colours faded from our clothes. The crowds of chattering spirits began to thin. After a few miles of walking, we began to hear a familiar screech in the distance. Looming on the horizon was a palace of glittering black obsidian. Above the parapets swirled their three dark bat-like creatures. The Furies. I got the feeling they were waiting for us. I suppose it's too late to turn back, Grover said wistfully. We'll be okay. I tried to sound confident. Maybe we should search some of the other places first, Grover suggested. Like Elysium, for instance. Come on, goat boy. Annabeth grabbed his arm. Grover yelped. His trainer sprouted wings and his legs shot forward, pulling him away from Annabeth. He landed flat on, it, flat on his back in the grass. Grover, Annabeth chided, stop messing around. But, but I didn't. He yelped again. His shoes were flapping like crazy now. They levitated off the ground and started dragging him away from us. Maya, he yelled. But the magic words seemed to have no effect. Maya, already, 911, help! I got over, being stunned, and made a grab for Grover's hand, but too late. He was picking up speed, skidding downhill like a bobsled. We ran after him. Annabeth shouted, untie the shoes! It was a smart idea, but I guess it's not easy when your shoes are pulling you along feet first at full speed. Grover tried to sit up, but he couldn't get close to the laces. We kept after him, trying to keep him in sight as he zipped between the legs of spirits who chattered at him in annoyance. I was sure Grover was going to barrel straight through the gates of Hades Palace, but his shoes veered sharply to the right and dragged him in the opposite direction. The slope got steeper. Grover picked up speed. Annabeth and I had to sprint to keep up. The cavern walls narrowed on either side and I realised we'd entered some kind of side tunnel. No black grass or trees now, but just underfoot rock underfoot, and the dim light of the stalactites above. Grover, I yelled, my voice echoing, hold on to something. What? He yelled back. He was grabbing at gravel, but there was nothing big enough to slow him down. The tunnel got darker and colder. The hairs on my arms bristled. It smelled evil down here. It made me think of things I shouldn't even know about. Blood spilled on an ancient stone altar, the foul breath of a murderer. Then I saw what was ahead of us, and I stopped dead in my tracks. The tunnel widened into a huge dark cavern, and in the middle was a chasm the size of a city block. 
Grover was sliding straight towards the edge. Come on, Percy, Annabeth yelled, tugging at my wrist. But that I know, she shouted. The place you described in your dream. But Grover's going to fall in if we don't catch him. She was right, of course. Grover's predicament got me moving again. He was yelling, clawing at the ground, but the winged shoes kept dragging him towards the pit, and it didn't look like we could possibly get to him in time. What saved him were his hooves. The flying sneakers had always been a loose fit on him, and finally Grover hit a big rock and the left shoe came flying off. It sped into the darkness, down into the chasm. The right shoe kept tugging him along, but not as fast. Grover was able to slow himself down by grabbing onto the big rock and using it like an anchor. He was three metres from the edge of the pit when we caught him and hauled him back up the slope. The other winged shoe tugged him itself off, circled around us as angrily and kicked our, our heads in protest before flying off into the chasm to join its twin. We all collapsed, exhausted, on the obsidian gravel. My limbs felt like lead. Even my backpack seemed heavier, as if somebody had filled it with rocks. Grover was scratched up pretty bad. His hands were bleeding. His eyes had gone split-pupiled, goat-style, the way they did whenever he was terrified. I don't know how, he panted. I, I, did I didn't. Wait, I said. Listen. I heard something, a deep whisper in the darkness. Another few seconds and Annabeth said, Percy, this place. Shh. I stood. The sound was getting louder, a muttering evil voice from far, far below us, coming from the pit. Grover sat up. Wh what's that noise? Annabeth heard it too now. I could see it in her eyes. Tartarus. The entrance to Tartarus. I uncapped Ana 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 Anaclusmos. The bronze sword expanded, gleaming in the darkness, and the evil voice seemed to falter just for a moment before resuming its chant. I could almost make out words now, ancient, ancient words, older than Greek, as if magic, I said. We have got to get out of here, Annabeth said. Together we dragged Grover to his hooves and started back up the tunnel. My legs wouldn't move fast enough. My backpack weighed me down. The voice got louder and angrier behind us and we broke into a run. Not a moment too soon. A cold blast of wind pulled at our backs as if the entire pit were inhaling. For a terrifying moment, I lost ground, my feet slipping in the gravel. If we'd been any closer to the edge, we would have been sucked in. We kept struggling forward and finally reached the top of the tunnel where the cavern widened out into the fields of Asphodel. The wind died. A wail of outrage echoed from deep in the tunnel. Something was not happy we'd got away. What was that? Grover panted when we collapsed in the relative safety of a black poplar grove. One of Hades pets? Annabeth and I looked at each other. I could tell she was nursing an idea, probably the same one she'd got during the taxi ride to LA, but she was too scared to share it. That was enough to terrify me. I capped my sword, put the pen back in my pocket. Let's get going. I looked at Grover. Can you walk? He swallowed. Yeah, sure. I never liked those shoes anyway. He tried to sound brave about it, but he was trembling as badly as Annabeth and I were. Whatever was in that pit was nobody's pet. It was unspeakably old and powerful. Even Echidna hadn't given me that feeling. I was almost relieved to turn my back on that tunnel and head towards the Palace of Hades. Almost. The Furies circled the parapets, high in the gloom. The outer walls of the fortress glittered black, and the two-storey tall bronze gates stood wide open. Up close I saw that the engravings on the gates were scenes of death. Some were from modern times, an atomic bomb exploding over a city, a trench filled with gas mask wearing soldiers, a line of African famine victims waiting with empty bowls. But all of them looked as if they'd been etched into the bronze thousands of years ago. I wondered if I was looking at prophecies that had come true. Inside the courtyard was the strangest garden I'd ever seen. Multicoloured mushrooms, poisonous shrubs and weird luminous plants grew without sunlight. Precious jewels made up for the lack of flowers, piles of rubies as big as my fist, clumps of raw diamonds. Standing here and there like frozen party guests were Medusa's garden statues, petrified children, satyrs and centaurs, all smiling grotesquely. In the centre of the garden was an orchard of pomegranate trees, their orange blooms neon bright in the dark. The garden a Persephone, Annabeth said. Keep walking. I understood why she wanted to move on. The tart smell of those pomegranates was almost overwhelming. I had a sudden desire to eat them, but then I remembered the story of Persephone. One bite of underworld food and we would never be able to leave. I pulled Grover away to keep him from picking a big juicy one. We walked up the steps of the palace, between black columns, through a black marble portico and into the house of Hades. The entry hall had a polished bronze floor which seemed to boil in the reflected torchlight. There was no ceiling, just the cavern roof far above. 
I guess they never had to worry about rain down here. Every side doorway was guarded by a skeleton in military gear. Some wore Greek armour, some British red coat uniforms, some camouflage with tattered American flags on the shoulders. They carried spears or muskets or M16s. None of them bothered us, but their hollow eye sockets followed us as we walked down the hall towards the big set of doors at the opposite end. Two US Marine skeletons guarded the doors. They grinned down at us, rocket-propelled grenade launchers held across their chests. You know, Grover mumbled, I bet Hades doesn't have trouble with door-to-door -door salesmen. My backpack weighed a ton now. I couldn't figure out why. I wanted to open it, check to see if I had somehow picked up a stray bowling ball, but this wasn't the time. Well, guys, I said, I suppose we should, uh, knock. A hot wind blew down the corridor and the door swung open. The guard stepped aside. I guess that means entree, Annabeth said. The room inside looked like in my dream, except this time the throne of Hades was occupied. He was the third god I'd met, but the first who really struck me as godlike. He was at least three metres tall, for one thing, and dressed in black silk robes and a crown of braided gold. His skin was albino white, his hair shoulder length and jet black. He wasn't bulked up like Ares, but he radiated power. He lounged on his throne of fused human bones, looking live, graceful and dangerous as a panther. I immediately felt like he should be giving the orders. He knew more than I did. He should be my master. And then I told myself to snap out of it. Hades' aura was affecting me, just as Ares had. The Lord of the Dead resembled pictures I'd seen of Adolf Hitler or Napoleon or the terrorist leaders who direct suicide bombers. Hades had the same intense eyes, the same kind of mesmerising evil charisma. You are brave to come here, son of Poseidon, he said in an oily voice. After what you have done to me, you are very brave indeed, or perhaps you are simply very foolish. Numbness crept into my joints, tempting me to lie down and just take a little nap at Hades' feet, curl up here and sleep forever. I fought the feeling and stepped forward. I knew what I had to say. Lord and uncle, I come with two requests. Hades raised an eyebrow. When he sat forward in his throne, shadowy faces appeared in the folds of his black robes, faces of torment, as if the garment was stitch of trapped souls from the fields of punishment, trying to get out. The ADHD part of me wondered, off task, whether the rest of his clothes were made the same way. What horrible things would you have to do in your life to get woven into Hades' underwear? Only two requests, Hades said, arrogant child, as if you have not already taken enough. Speak then, it amuses me not to strike you dead yet. I swallowed. This was going about as well as I'd feared. I glanced at the empty, smaller throne next to Hades. It was shaped like a black flower, gilded with gold. I wished Queen Persephone was here. I recalled something in the myths about how she could calm her husband's moods. But it was summer. Of course, Persephone would be above in the world of light with her mother, the goddess of agriculture, Dem Demeter. Her visits, not the tilt of the earth, created the seasons. Annabeth cleared her throat. Her finger prodded me in the back. Lord Hades, I said. Look, sir, there can't be a war among the gods. It would be uh, bad. Really bad, Grover added helpfully. Return Zeus's master bolt to me, I said. Please, sir, let me carry it to Olympus. Hades' eyes grew dangerously bright. You dare keep up this pretense after what you have done? I glanced back at my friends. They looked as confused as I was. Um, uncle, I said, you keep saying after what I've done. Uh, what exactly have I done? The throne room shook with a tremor so strong they probably felt it upstairs in Los Angeles. Debris fell from the cavern ceiling, doors burst open all along the walls and skeletal warriors marched in, hundreds of them, from every time period and nation in Western civilization. They lined the perimeter of the room, blocking the exits. Hades bellowed, Do you think I want war, godling? I wanted to say, well, these guys don't look like peace activists, but I thought that might be a dangerous answer. You... Are the Lord of the Dead, I said carefully. A war would expand your kingdom, right? A typical thing for my brothers to say. Do you think I need more subjects? Did you not see the sprawl of Asphodel? Well, have you any idea how much my kingdom has swollen in this past century alone? How many subdivisions I've had to open? I opened my mouth to respond, but Hades was on a roll now. More security ghouls, he moaned. Traffic problems at the Judgment Pavilion. Double overtime for the staff. I used to be the rich god, Percy Jackson. I control all the precious metals under the earth. But my expenses. Charon wants a pay rise, I blurted, just remembering the fact. As soon as I said it, I wished I could sew up my mouth. Don't get me started on Charon. 
Hades yelled. He's been impossible ever since he discovered Italian suits. Problems everywhere, and I've got to handle all of them personally. The commute time alone from the palace to the gates is enough to drive me insane. And the dead just keep arriving. No, godling, I need no help getting subjects. I did not ask for this war. But you took Zeus's master bolt. Lies! More rumbling. Hades rose from his throne, towering to the height of a football goalpost. Your father may fool Zeus, boy, but I am not so stupid. I see his plan. His plan? You were the thief on the winter solstice, he said. Your father fought to keep you <laughs> this little secret. He directed you into the throne room on Olympus. You took the master bolt and my helmet. Had I not sent my fury to discover you at Yancey Academy, Poseidon might have succeeded in hiding his scheme to start a war. But now you have been forced into the open. You will be exposed as Poseidon's thief and I will have my helmet back. But, Annabeth spoke, I could tell her mind was going a million miles an hour. Lord Hades, your helmet of darkness is missing too. Do not play innocent with me, girl. You and the satyr have been helping this hero, coming here to threaten me in Poseidon's name, no doubt, to bring me an ultimatum. Does Poseidon think I can be blackmailed into supporting him? No, I said. Poseidon didn't. I didn't. I have said nothing of the helmet's disappearance, Hades snarled, because I had no illusions that anyone on Olympus would offer me the slightest justice, the slightest help. I can ill afford for word to get out that my most powerful weapon of fear is missing. So I searched for you myself, and when it was clear you were coming to me to deliver your threat, I did not try to stop you. You didn't try to stop us, but return my helmet now or I will stop death, Hades threatened. That is my counter-proposal. I will open the earth and have the dead pour back into the world. I will make your lands a nightmare. And you, Percy Jackson, your skeleton will lead my army out of Hades. The skeletal sol soldiers all took one step forward, making their weapons ready. At that point, I probably should have, should have been terrified. The strange thing was, I felt offended. Nothing gets me angrier than being accused of something I, had I didn't do. I've had a lot of experience with that. You're as bad as Zeus, I said. You think I stole from you. That's why you sent the Furies after me. Of course, Hades said. And the other monsters? Hades curled his lip. I had nothing to do with them. I wanted no quick death for you. I wanted you brought before me alive so you might face every torture in the fields of punishment. Why do you think I let you enter my kingdom so easily? Easily? Return my property. But I don't have your helmet. I came from the Master Bolt, which you already possess, Hades shouted. You come here with it, little fool, thinking you could threaten me. But I didn't. Open your pack then. A horrible feeling struck me. The weight in my backpack, like a bowling boy, bowling ball. It couldn't be. I slung it off my shoulder and unzipped it. Inside was a 60 centimetre long metal cylinder, spiked on both ends, humming with energy. Percy, Annabeth said. How? I, I don't know. I don't understand. You heroes are always the same, Hades said. Your pride makes you foolish, thinking you could bring such a weapon before me. I did not ask for Zeus's master bolt, but since it is here, you will yield it to me. I am sure it will make an excellent bargaining tool. And now, my helmet, where is it? I was speechless. I had no helmet. I had no idea how the master bolt had got into my backpack. I wanted to think Hades was pulling some kind of trick. Hades was the bad guy, but suddenly the world turned sideways. I realised... I'd been played with Zeus. Poseidon and Hades had been set at each other's throats by someone else. The Master Bolt had been in the backpack, and I'd got the backpack from... Lord Hades, wait, I said. This is all a mistake. A mistake, Hades roared. The skeletons aimed their weapons. From high above, there was a fluttering of leathery wings, and the three furies swooped down to perch on the back of their master's throne. The one with Mrs. Dodd's face grinned at me eagerly and flicked her whip. There is no mistake, Hades said. I know why you have come. I know the real reason. You brought the boat. You came to bargain for her. Hades loosed a ball of gold fire from his palm. It exploded on the steps in front of me. And there was my mother, frozen in a shower of gold, just as she was at the moment when the Minotaur began to squeeze her to death. I couldn't speak. I reached out to touch her, but the light was as hot as a bonfire. Yes, Hades said with satisfaction. I took her. I knew, Percy Jackson, that you would come to bargain with me eventually. Return my helmet, and perhaps I will let her go. She is not dead, you know. Not yet. But if you displease me, that will change. I thought about the pearls in my pocket, 
Maybe they could get me out of this. If I could just get my mum free. Ah, the pearls, Hades said, and my blood froze. Yes, my brother and his little tricks. Bring them forth, Percy Jackson. My hand moved against my will and brought out the pearls. Only three, Hades said. What a shame. You do realise each only protects a single person. Try to take your mother. Then, little godling, and which of your friends will you leave behind to spend eternity with me? Go on, choose, or give me the backpack and accept my terms. I looked at Annabeth and Grover. Their faces were grim. We were tricked, I told them. Set up. Yes, but why? Annabeth asked. And the voice in the pit. I don't know yet, I said, but I intend to ask. Decide, boy, Hades yelled. Percy, Grover put his hand on my shoulder. You can't give him the bolt. I know that. Leave me here, he said. Use the third pearl on your mum. No, I'm a satyr, Grover said. We don't have souls like humans do. He can torture me until I die, but he won't get me forever. I'll just be reincarnated as a flower or something. It's the best way. No, Annabeth drew her bronze knife. You two go on. Grover, you have to protect Percy. You have to get your searcher's license and start your quest for Pan. Get his mum out of here. I'll cover you. I plan to go down fighting. No way, Grover said. I'm staying behind. Think again, goat boy, Annabeth said. Stop it, both of you. I felt like my heart was being ripped in two. They had both been with me through so much. I remember Grover dive-bombing Medusa in the statue garden and Annabeth saving us from Cerberus. We'd survived Hephaestus's Waterland Ride, the St. Louis Arch, the Lotus Casino. I had spent thousands of miles worried that I'd be betrayed by a friend, but these friends would never do that. They had done nothing but save me over and over, and now they wanted to sacrifice their lives for my mum. I know what to do, I said. Take these. I handed them each a pearl. Annabeth said, but, but Percy. I turned and faced my mother. I desperately wanted to sacrifice myself and use the last pearl on her, but I knew what she would say. She would never allow it. I had to get the bolt back to Olympus and tell Zeus the truth. I had to stop the war. She would never forgive me if I saved her instead. I thought about the prophecy made at Half-Blood Hill, what seemed like a million years ago. You will fail to save what matters most in the end. I'm sorry, I told her. I'll be back. I'll find a way. The smug look on Hades' face faded. He said, Godling? I'll find your helmet, uncle, I told him. I'll return it. Remember about Charon's pay rise. Do not defy me. And it wouldn't hurt to play with Cerberus once in a while. He likes red rubber balls. Percy Jackson, you will not... I shouted, now guys, we smashed the pearls at our feet. For a scary moment, nothing happened. Hades yelled, destroy them. The army of skeletons rushed forward, swords out, guns clicking to full automatic. The Furies lunged, their whips bursting into flame. Just as the skeletons opened fire, the pearl exploded at my feet with a burst of green light and a gust of fresh sea wind. I was encased in a milky white sphere, which was starting to float off the ground. Annabeth and Grover were right behind me. Spears and bullets sparked harmlessly off the pearl bubbles as we floated up. Hades yelled with such rage the entire fortress shook and I knew it was not going to be a peaceful night in LA. Look up, Grover yelled. We're going to crash. Sure enough, we were racing right towards the stalactites, which I figured would pop our bubbles and skewer us. How do you control these things? Annabeth shouted. I don't think you do, I shouted back. We screamed as the bubbles slammed into the ceiling and darkness. Were we dead? No, I could still feel the racing sensation. We were going up, right through solid rock as easily as the air bubble in water. That was the power of the pearls. I realised what belongs to the sea will always return to the sea. For a few moments, I couldn't see anything outside the smooth walls of my sphere, and then my pearl broke through on the ocean floor. The two other milky spheres, Annabeth and Grover, kept pace with me as we soared upward through the water. And kablam! We exploded on the surface in the middle of Los Angeles Bay, knocking a surfer off his board with an indignant, Dude! I grabbed Grover and hauled him over as a life boy. I caught Annabeth and dragged her over too. A curious shark was circling us, a great white about three metres long. I said, Beat it! And the shark turned and raced away. The surfer screamed something about bad mushrooms and paddled away from us as fast as he could. Somehow I knew what time it was. Early morning, June 21st, the day of the summer solstice. In the distance, Los Angeles was on fire, plumes of smoke rising from neighbourhoods all over the city. There had been an earthquake. All right, and it was Hades' fault. 
He was probably sending an army of the dead after me right now. But at the moment, the underworld wasn't my biggest problem. I had to get to shore. I had to get Zeus's thunderbolt back to Olympus. Most of all, I had to have a serious conversation with a god who had tricked me. Chapter 20. I battle my jerk relative. A coast guard boat picked us up, but they were too busy to keep us for long, or to wonder how three kids in street clothes had got out into the middle of the bay. There was a disaster to mop up. The ra their radios were jammed with distress calls. They dropped us off at the Santa Monica Pier with towels around our shoulders and water bottles that said, I'm a junior coast guard, and sped off to save more people. Our clothes were sopping wet, even mine. When the coast guard boat had appeared, I'd silently prayed they wouldn't pick me out of the water and find me perfectly dry, which might have raised some eyebrows. So I'd willed myself to get soaked. Sure enough, my usual waterproof magic had abandoned me. I was also barefoot because I'd given my shoes to Grover. Better the Coast Guard wonder why one of us was barefoot than wonder why one of us had hooves. After reaching dry land, we stumbled down the beach, watching the city burn against a beautiful sunrise. I felt as if I'd just come back from the dead, which I had. My backpack was heavy with Zeus's master bolt. My heart was even heavier from seeing my mother. I don't believe it, Annabeth said. We went all that way. It was a trick, I said. A strategy worthy of Athena. Hey, she warned. You get it, don't you? She dropped her eyes, her anger fading. Yeah, I get it. Well, I don't, Grover complained. Would somebody? Percy, Annabeth said. I'm sorry about your mother. I'm so sorry. I pretended not to hear her. If I talked about my mother, I was going to start crying like a little kid. The prophecy was right, I said. You shall go west and face the god who has turned. But it wasn't Hades. Hades didn't want war between the fig three. Someone else pulled off the theft. Someone stole Zeus's master bolt and Hades' helmet and framed me because I'm Poseidon's kid. Poseidon will get blamed by both sides. By sundown today, there will be a three-way war, and I'll have caused it. Grover shook his head, mystified. But who would be that sneaky? Who would want war that bad? I stopped in my tracks, looking down the beach. Gee, uh, let me think. There he was, waiting for us, in his black leather duster in his sunglasses, an aluminium baseball bat propped on his shoulder. His motorcycle rumbled beside him, its headlight turning the sand red. Hey, kid, Ares said, seeming genuinely pleased to see me. You were supposed to die. You tricked me, I said. You stole the helmet and the master bolt. Ares grinned. Well, now, I didn't steal them personally. Gods taking each other's symbols of power, that's a big no-no. But you're not the only hero in the world who can run errands. Who did you use? Clarice? She was there at the winter solstice. The idea seemed to amuse him. Doesn't matter. The point is, kid, you're impeding the war effort. See, you've got to die in the underworld, and then old seaweed will be mad at Hades for killing you. Corpse breath will have Zeus's master bolt, so Zeus will be mad at him, and Hades is still looking for this. From his pocket, he took out a ski cap, the kind bank robbers wear, and placed it between the handlebars of his bike. Immediately, the cap transformed into an elaborate bronze war helmet. The helmet of darkness, Grover gasped. Exactly, Ares said. Now where was I? Oh yeah, Hades will be mad at both Zeus and Poseidon because he doesn't know who took this. Pretty soon, we got a nice little three-way slugfest going. But they're your family, Annabeth protested. Ares shrugged. Best kind of war, always the bloodiest. Nothing like watching your relatives fight, I always say. You gave me the backpack in Denver, I said. The master bolt was in there the whole time. Yes and no, Ares said. It's probably too complicated for your little mortal brain to follow, but the backpack is the master bolt sheath, just morphed a bit. The bolt is connected to it, sort of like the sword you got, kid. It always returns to your pocket, right? I wasn't sure how Ares knew about that, but I guess a god of war had made it his business to know about weapons. Anyway, Ares continued, I tinkered with the magic a bit so the bolt would only return to the sheaf once you t reached the underworld. You got close to Hades. Bingo, you got mail. If you died along the way, no loss. I still had the weapon. But why not just keep the master bolt for yourself, I said. Why send it to Hades? Ares got a twitch in his jaw. For a moment, it was almost as if he were listening to another voice, deep inside his head. Why didn't I? Yeah, with that kind of firepower. He held the trance for one second, two seconds. I exchanged nervous looks with Annabeth. Ares' face cleared. I didn't want the trouble. Better to have you caught red-handed holding the thing. You're lying, I said. Sending the bolt to the underworld wasn't your idea, was it? Of course it was. Smoke drifted up from his sunglasses as if they were about to catch fire. 
You didn't order the theft, I guessed. Someone else sent a hero to steal the two items. And then, when Zeus sent you to hunt him down, you caught the thief. But you didn't turn him over to Zeus. Something convinced you to let him go. You kept the items until another hero could come along and complete the delivery. That thing in the pit is ordering you around. I am the god of war. I take orders from no one. I don't have dreams. I hesitated. Who said anything about dreams? Ares looked agitated, but he tried to cover it with a smirk. Let's get back to the problem at hand, kid. You're alive. I can't have you taking the bolt to Olympus. You just might get those hard-headed idiots to listen to you. So I've got to kill you. Nothing personal. He snapped his fingers. The sand exploded at his feet and out charged a wild boar, even larger and uglier than the one whose head hung above the door of Cabin 7 at Camp Halfblood. The beast poured the sand, glaring at me with beady eyes as it lowered its razor-sharp tusks and waited for the command to kill. I stepped into the surf. Fight me yourself, Ares. He laughed, but I heard a little edge to his laughter, an uneasiness. You've only got one talent, kid, running away. You ran from the Chimera. You ran from the underworld. You don't have what it takes. Scared? In your adolescent dreams. But his sunglasses were starting to melt from the heat of his eyes. No direct involvement. Sorry, kid. You're not at my level. Annabeth said, Percy, run. The giant boar charged. But I was done running from monsters. Or Hades. Or Ares. Or anybody. As the boar rushed me, I uncapped my pen and sidestepped. Riptide appeared in my hands. I slashed upwards. The boar's severed right tusk fell at my feet while the disorientated animal charged into the sea. I shouted, wave. Immediately a wave surged up from nowhere and engulfed the boar, wrapping around it like a blanket. The beast squealed once in terror and then it was gone, swallowed by the sea. I turned back to Ares. Are you going to fight me now? I asked. Or are you going to hide behind another pet pig? Ares' face was purple with rage. Watch it, kid. I could turn you into a cockroach, I said, or a tapeworm. Yeah, I'm sure. That'd save you from getting your godly hide whipped, wouldn't it? Flames danced along the top of his glasses. Oh man, you are really asking to be smashed into a grease spot. If I lose, turn me into anything you want. Take the bolt. If I win, the helmet and the bolt are mine and you have to go away. Ares sneered. He swung his baseball bat off his shoulder. How would you like to get smashed? Classic or modern? I showed him my sword. That's cool, dead boy, he said. Classic it is. The baseball bat changed into a huge two-handed sword. The hilt was a large silver skull with a ruby in its mouth. Percy, Annabeth said, don't do this. He's a god. He's a coward, I told her. She swallowed. Wear this at least, for luck. She took off her necklace and with, with her five years worth of camp beads and the ring from her father and tied it around my neck. Reconciliation, she said. Athena and Poseidon together. My false face felt a little warm, but I managed to smile. Thanks. And take this, Grover said. He handed me a flattened tin can that he'd probably been saving in his pocket for a thousand miles. The satyrs stand behind you. Grover, I don't know what to say. He patted me on the shoulder. I stuffed the tin can in my back pocket. You all done saying goodbye? Ares came towards me, his black leather duster trailing behind him, his sword glinting like fire in the sunrise. I've been fighting for eternity, kid. My strength is unlimited and I cannot die. What have you got? A smaller ego, I thought, but I said nothing. I kept my feet in the turf, backing into the water up to my ankles. I thought back to what Annabeth had said at the Denver diner so long ago. Ares has strength, that's all he has. Even strength has to, has to bow to wisdom sometimes. He cleaved downward at my head, but I wasn't there. My body fought for me. The water seemed to push me into the air and I catapulted over him, slashing as I came down. But Ares was just as quick. He twisted, and the strike that should have caught him directly in the spine was deflected off the end of his sword hilt. He grinned. Not bad. Not bad. He slashed again, and I was forced to jump into dry land. I tried to sidestep to get back into the water, but Ares seemed to know what I wanted. He outmaneuvered me, pressing so hard I had to put all my concentration on not getting sliced into pieces. I kept backing away from the surf. I couldn't find any openings to attack. His sword had a reach a metre longer than an Anaclysmus. Getting close, Luke had told me once, back in our sword class, when you've got the shorter blade, getting close. I stepped inside with a thrust, but Ares was waiting for that. He knocked my blade out of my hands and kicked me in the chest. I went airborne, 15, maybe 20 metres. I would have broken my back 
if I hadn't crashed into the soft sand of a dune. Percy! Annabeth yelled. Cops! I was seeing double. My chest felt like it had just been hit with a battering ram, but I managed to get to my feet. I couldn't look away from Ares for fear he'd slice me in half, but out of the corner of my eye I saw red lights flashing on the shoreline boulevard. Car doors were slamming. There, officer, somebody yelled. See? A gruff cop voice. Looks like that kid on TV. What the heck? That guy's armed, another cop said. Call for backup. I rolled to one side as Ares' blade slashed the sand. I ran for my sword, scooped it up, and launched a swipe at Ares' face, only to find my blade deflected again. Ares seemed to know exactly what I was going to do the moment before I did it. I stepped back towards the surf, forcing him to follow. Admit it, kid, Ares said. You've got no hope. I'm just toying with you. My senses were working overtime. I now understood what Annabeth had said about ADHD, keeping you alive in battle. I was wide awake, noticing every little detail. I could see where Ares was tensing. I could tell which way he would strike. At the same time, I was aware of Annabeth and Grover, ten metres to my left. I saw a second cop car pulling up, siren wailing. Spectators, people who had been wandering the streets because of the earthquake, were starting to gather. Among the crowd, I thought I saw a few who were walking with the strange, trotting gait of disguised satyrs. There were shimmering forms of spirits, too, as if the dead had risen from Hades to watch the battle. I heard the flap of leathery wings circling somewhere above. More sirens. I stepped further into the water, but Ares was fast. The tip of his blade ripped my sleeve and grazed my forearm. A police voice on a megaphone said, Drop the guns! Set them on the ground, now! Guns? I looked at Ares' weapon and it seemed to be flickering. Sometimes it looked like a shotgun, sometimes a two-handed sword. I didn't know what the humans were seeing in my hands, but I was pretty sure it wouldn't make them like me. Ares turned to glare at our spectators, which gave me a moment to breathe. There were five police cars now, and a line of officers crouching behind them, pistols trained on us. This is a private matter, Ares bellowed. Be gone! He swept his hand and a wall of red flame rolled across the patrol cars. The police barely had time to dive for cover before the vehicles exploded. The crowd behind them scattered, screaming. Ares roared with laughter. Now, little hero, let's add you to the barbecue. He slashed. I deflected his blade. I got close enough to strike, tried to fake him out with a feint, but my blow was knocked aside. The waves were hitting me in the back now. Ares was up on his thighs, wading in after me. I felt the rhythm of the sea, the waves growing larger as the tide rolled in, and suddenly I had an idea. Little waves, I thought, and the water behind me seemed to recede. I was holding back the tide by force of will, but tension was building like carbonation behind a cork. Ares came towards me, grinning confidently. I lowered my blade, as if I were too exhausted to go on. Wait for it, I told the sea. The pressure now was, the, was almost lifting me off my feet. Ares raised his sword. I released the tide and jumped, rocketing straight over Ares on a wave. A two-metre wall of water smashed him full in the face, leaving him cursing and spluttering with a mouth full of seaweed. I landed behind him with a splash and fainted towards his head as I'd done before. He turned in time to raise his sword, but this time he was disorientated. He didn't anticipate the trick. I changed direction, lunged to the side and stabbed Riptide straight down into the water, sending the point through the god's heel. The roar that followed made Hades' earthquake look like a minor event. The very sea was blasted back from Ares, leaving a wet circle of sand 15 metres wide. Ikor, the golden blood of the gods, flowed from a gash in the war god's boot. The expression on his face was beyond hatred. It was pain, shock, complete disbelief that he'd been wounded. He limped towards me, muttering ancient Greek curses. Something stopped him. It was as if a cloud covered the sun, but worse. Light faded. Sound and colour drained away. A cold, heavy presence passed over the beach, slowing time, dropping the temperature to freezing, and making me feel like life was hopeless. Fighting was useless. The darkness lifted. Ares looked stunned. Police cars were burned behind us. The crowd of spectators had fled. Annabeth and Grover stood on the beach in shock, watching the water flood back around Ares' feet, his glowing golden ichor dissipa dissipating in the tide. Ares lowered his sword. You have made an enemy, godling, he told me. You have sealed your fate. Every time you raise your blade in battle, every time you hope for success, you will feel my curse. Beware, Perseus Jackson. Beware. His body began to glow. Percy, Annabeth shouted, don't watch. 
I turned away as the god Ares revealed his true, immortal form. I somehow knew that if I looked, I would disintegrate into ashes. The light died. I looked back. Ares was gone. The tide rolled out to reveal Hades' bronze helmet of darkness. I picked it up and walked towards my friends. But before I got there, I heard the flapping of leathery wings. Three evil-looking grandmothers with lace hats and fiery whips drifted down from the sky and landed in front of me. The middle fury, the one who had been Mrs. Dodd, stepped forward. Her fangs were bared, but for once she didn't look threatening. She looked more disappointed, as if she'd been planning to have me for supper, but had decided I might give her indigestion. We saw the whole thing, she hissed. So, it truly was not you. I tossed her the helmet, which she caught in surprise. Return that to Lord Hades, I, I said. Tell him the truth. Tell him to call off the war. She hesitated and then ran a forked tongue over the green leathery lips. Live well, Percy Jackson. Become a true hero, because if you do not, if you ever come into my clutches again. She cackled, savouring the idea, and then she and her sisters rose on their bat swings, fluttering into the smoke-filled sky and disappeared. I joined Grover and Annabeth, who were staring at me in amazement. Percy, Grover said. That was so incredibly... Terrifying, said Annabeth. Cool, Grover corrected. I didn't feel terrified. I certainly didn't feel cool. I was tired and sore and completely drained of energy. Did you guys feel that? Whatever it was, I asked. They both nodded uneasily. Must have been the Furies overhead, Grover said. But I wasn't so sure. Something had stopped Ares from killing me, and whatever could do that was a lot stronger than the Furies. I looked at Annabeth, and under an understanding passed between us. I knew now that it was in that pit, what had spoken from the entrance of Tartarus. I reclaimed my backpack from Grover and I looked inside. The master bolt was still there. Such a small thing to almost cause World, World, World War Three. We have to get back to New York, I said. By tonight. That's impossible, Annabeth said, unless we... Fly, I agreed. She stared at me. Fly, like in, in an aeroplane, which you were warned never to do, lest you strike you out of the sky, and carrying a weapon that has more destructive power than a nuclear bomb? Yeah, I said. Pretty much exactly like that. Come on. Chapter 21. I Settle My Tab It's funny how humans can wrap their mind around things and fit them into their version of reality. Chiron had told me that long ago. As usual, I didn't appreciate his wisdom until much later. According to the LA News, the explosion at the Santa Monica beach had been caused when a crazy kidnapper fired a shotgun at a police car. He accidentally hit a gas main that had ruptured during the earthquake. This crazy kidnapper, aka Ares, was the same man who had abducted me and two other adolescents in New York and brought us across country on a 10-day odyssey of terror. Poor little Percy Jackson wasn't an international criminal, after all. He'd caused a commotion on that Greyhound bus in New Jersey trying to get away from his captor, and afterwards witnesses would even swear they had seen the leather-clad man on the bus. Why didn't I remember him before? The crazy man had caused the explosion in the St. Louis Arch, after all no kid could have done that. A concerned waitress in Denver had seen the man threatening his abductees outside her diner, gotten a friend to take a photo and notified the police. Finally, brave Percy Jackson, I was beginning to like this kid, had stolen a gun from his captor in Los Angeles and battled him shotgun to rifle on the beach. Police had arrived just in time, but in the spectacular explosion, five police cars had been destroyed and the captor had fled. No fatalities had occurred. Percy Jackson and his two friends were safely in police custody. The reporters fed us the whole story. We just nodded and acted tearful and exhausted, which wasn't hard, and played victimised kids for the cameras. All I want, I said, choking back my tears, is to see my loving stepfather again. Every time I saw him on TV calling me a delinquent punk, I knew, somehow, we would be okay. And I know he'll want to reward each and every person in this beautiful city of Los Angeles with a free major appliance from his store. Here's the phone number. The police and reporters were so moved that they passed around the hat and raised money for free tickets on the next plane to New York. I knew there was no choice but to fly. I hoped Zeus would cut me some slack, considering the circumstances, but it was still hard to force myself on board the flight. Takeoff was a nightmare. Every spot of turbulence was scarier than a Greek monster. I didn't unclench my hands from the armrests until we touched down safely at LaGuardia. The local press was waiting for us outside security, but we managed to evade them thanks to Annabeth, who lured them away in her invisible Yankees cap, shouting, They're over by the frozen yoghurt! Come on! And then rejoined us at baggage claim. We split up at the taxi stand. I told Annabeth and Grover to get back to Half-Blood Hill and let Kyron know what had happened. They protested, and it was hard to let them go after all we'd been through. 
but I knew I had to do this last part of the quest by myself. If things went wrong, if the gods didn't believe me, I wanted Annabeth and Grover to survive to tell Kyron the truth. I hopped in a taxi and headed into Manhattan. Thirty minutes later, I walked into the lobby of the Empire State Building. I must have looked like a homeless kid with my tattered clothes and my scraped up face. I hadn't slept in, the le in at least 24 hours. I went up to the guard at the front desk and said, 600th floor. He was reading a huge book with a picture of a wizard on the front. I wasn't much into fantasy, but the book must have been good because the guard took a while to look up. No such floor, kiddo. I need an audience with Zeus. He gave me a vacant smile. Sorry? You heard me. I was about to decide this guy was just a regular mortal, and I'd better run for it before he called the straitjacket patrol when he said, No appointment. No audience, kiddo. Lord's use doesn't see anyone unannounced. Oh, I think he'll make an exception. I slipped off my backpack and unzipped the top. The guard looked inside at the metal cylinder, not getting what it was for a few seconds, and then his face went pale. This isn't. Yes, it is, I promised. You want me to take it out and... No, no! He scrambled out of his seat, fumbled around his desk for a keycard, and then handed it to me. Insert this in the security slot. Make sure nobody else in the elevator is with you. I did, as he told me. As soon as the elevator doors closed, I slipped the key into the slot. The card disappeared and a new button appeared on the console, a red one that said 600. I pressed it and waited, and waited. Muzak played, raindrops keep falling on my head. Finally, ding, the doors slid open. I stepped out and almost had a heart attack. I was standing on a narrow stone walkway in the middle of the air. Below me was Manhattan, from the height of an aeroplane. In front of me, White marble steps wound up the spine of the cloud into the sky. My eyes followed the stairway to its end where my brain just could not accept what I saw. Look again, my brain said. We're looking, my eyes insisted. It's really there. From the top of the clouds rose the decapitated peak of a mountain, its summit covered with snow. Clinging to the mountainside were dozens of multi-leveled palaces, a city of mansions, all with white columned porticos, gilded terraces and bronze braziers glowing with a thousand fires. Roads wound crazily up to the peak where the largest palace gleamed against the snow. Precariously perched, gardens bloomed with olive trees and rose bushes. I could make out an open air market filled with colourful tents, a stone amphitheatre built on one side of the mountain, a hippodrome and a colosseum on the other. It was an ancient Greek city, except it wasn't in ruins. It was new and clean and colourful, the way Athens must have looked 2,500 years ago. This place can't be here, I told myself. The tip of a mountain, hanging over New York City like a billion-ton asteroid. How could something like that be anchored above the Empire State Building, in plain sight of millions of people, and not get noticed? But here it was, and here I was. My trip through Olympus was a daze. I passed some giggling wood nymphs who threw olives at me from their garden. Hawkers in the market offered to sell me ambrosia on a stick, and a new shield, and a genuine glitter-weave replica of the Golden Fleece, as seen on Hephaestus TV. The nine muses were tuning their instruments for a concert in the park, while a small crowd gathered, satyrs and naiads, and a bunch of good-looking teenagers who might have been minor gods and goddesses. Nobody seemed worried about an impending civil war. In fact, everybody seemed in festive mood. Several of them turned to watch me pass and whispered to themselves. I climbed the main road towards the big palace at the peak. It was a reverse copy of the palace in the underworld. There, everything had been black and bronze. Here, everything glittered white and silver. I realised Hades must have built his palace to resemble this one. He wasn't welcomed in Olympus, except on winter solstice, so he'd built his own Olympus underground. Despite my bad experience with him, I felt a little sorry for the guy. To be banished from this place seemed really unfair. It would make anybody bitter. Steps led up to a central courtyard. Past that, the throne room. Room really isn't the right word. The place made Grand Central Station look like a broom closet. Massive columns rose to a domed ceiling, which was gilded with moving constellations. Twelve thrones, built for beings the size of Hades, were arranged in an inverted U, just like the cabins at Camp Half-Blood. An enormous fire crackled in the central half-pit. The thrones were empty except for two at the end, the head thrown on the right and the one to its immediate left. I didn't have to be told who the gods were that were sitting there, waiting for me to approach. I came towards them, my legs trembling. The gods were in giant human form, as Hades had been, but I could barely look at them without feeling a tingle as if my body was starting to burn. Zeus, the lord of the gods, wore a dark blue pinstripe suit. He sat on a simple throne of solid platinum. He had a well-trimmed beard, marbled grey, 
and black like a storm cloud. His face was proud and handsome and grim, his eyes rainy grey. As I got nearer to him, the air crackled and smelled of ozone. The god sitting next to him was his brother, without a doubt, but he was dressed very differently. He reminded me of a beachcomber from Key West. He wore leather sandals, khaki Bermuda shorts, and a Tommy Bahama shirt, with coconuts and parrots all over it. His skin was deeply tanned, his hands scarred like an old-time fisherman's. His hair was black like mine. His face had that same brooding look that had always got me branded a rebel, but his eyes, a sea green like mine, were surrounded by sun crinkles that told me he smiled a lot, too. His throne was a deep sea fisherman's chair. It was the simple swivelling kind, with a black leather seat and built-in holster for a fishing pole. Instead of a pole, the holster held a bronze trident, flickering with green light around the tips. The gods weren't moving or speaking, but there was tension in the air, as if they'd just finished an argument. I approached the fisherman's throne and knelt at his feet. Father, I dared not look up. My heart was racing. I could feel the energy emanating from the two gods. If I said the wrong thing, I had no doubt they could blast me into dust. To my left, Zeus spoke. Should you not address the master of this house first, boy? I kept my head down and waited. Peace, brother, Poseidon finally said. His voice stirred my oldest memories. That warm glow I remembered as a baby, the sensation of this god's hand on my forehead. The boy defers to his father. This is only right. You still claim him, then? Zeus asked menacingly. You claim this child whom you sired against our sacred oath? I have admitted my wrongdoing, Poseidon said. Now I would hear him speak. Wrongdoing? A lump welled up in my throat. Was that all I was? A wrongdoing? The result of a god's mistake? I have spared him once already, Zeus grumbled. Daring to fly through my domain, <laughs> I should have blasted him out of the sky for his impudence. And risk destroying your own master bolt, Poseidon asked calmly. Let us hear him out, brother. Zeus grumbled some more. I shall listen, he decided. Then I shall make up my mind whether or not to cast this boy down from Olympus. Perseus, Poseidon said, look at me. I did, and I wasn't sure what I saw in his face. There was no clear sign of love or approval, nothing to encourage me. It was like looking at the ocean. Some days you could tell what mood it was in. Most days, though, it was unreadable, mysterious. I got the feeling Poseidon really didn't know what to think of me. He didn't know whether he was happy to have me as a son or not. In a strange way, I was glad that Poseidon was so distant. If he tried to apologise or told me he loved me or even smiled, it would have felt fake. Like a human dad making some lame excuse for not being around. I could live with that. After all, I wasn't sure about him yet, either. Address Lord Zeus, boy. Poseidon told him, tell him your story. So I told Zeus everything, just as it had happened. I to took out the metal cylinder, which began sparking on the sky god's presence, and laid it at his, at his feet. There was a long silence, broken only by the crackle of the half-fire. Zeus opened his palm. The lightning bolt flew into it. As he closed his fist, the metallic points flared with electricity, until he was holding what looked more like the classic thunderbolt, a five-metre javelin of arcing, hissing energy that made the hairs on my scalp rise. I sense the boy tells the truth, Zeus muttered, but that Ares would do such a thing. It is most unlike him. He is proud and impulsive, Poseidon said. It runs in the family. Lord, I asked. They both said, yes. Ares didn't act alone. Someone else, something else, came up with the idea. I described my dreams and the feeling I'd had on the beach, that momentary breath of evil that had seemed to stop the world and make Ares back off from killing me. In the dreams, I said, the voice told me to bring the bolt to the underworld. Ares hinted that he'd been having dreams too. I, I think he was being used, just as I was, to start a war. You're accusing Hades, after all, Zeus asked. No, I said, I mean, Lord Zeus, I've been in the presence of Hades. This feeling on the beach was different. It was the same thing I felt when I got close to that pit. That was the entrance to Tartarus, wasn't it? Something powerful and evil is stirring down there, something even older than the gods. Poseidon and Zeus looked at each other. They had a quick, intense discussion in ancient Greek. I only caught one word, father. Poseidon made some kind of suggestion, but Zeus cut him off. Poseidon tried to argue. Zeus held up his hand angrily. We will speak of this no more. Zeus said, I must go personally to purify this thunderbolt in the waters of Lemnos to remove the human taint from its metal. He rose and looked at me. His expression softened just a fraction of a degree. You have done me a service, boy. Few heroes could have accomplished as much. I had help, sir, I said. Grover Underwood and Annabeth Chase. To show you my thanks, I shall spare your life. 
I do not trust you, Perseus Jackson. I do not like what your arrival means for the future of Olympus. But for the sake of peace in the family, I shall let you live. Um, thank you, sir. Do not presume to fly again. Do not let me find you here when I return. Otherwise, you shall taste this bolt, and it shall be your last sensation. Thunder shook the palace with a blinding flash of lightning. Zeus was gone. I was alone in the throne room with my father. Your uncle, Poseidon sighed, has always had a flair for dramatic exits. I think he would have done well as the god of theatre. An uncomfortable silence. Sir, I said, what was in that pit? Poseidon regarded me. Have you not guessed? Cronus, I said, the king of the Titans. Even in the throne room of Olympus, far away from Tartarus, the name Cronus, dark in the room, made the half fire seem not quite to warm on my back, quite, quite so warm on my back. Poseidon gripped his trident. In the first war, Percy, Zeus cut our father, Cronus, into a thousand pieces, just as Cronus had done to his own father. Uranus, Zeus cast Cronus's remains into the darkest pit of Tartarus. The Titan army was scattered, their mountain fortress on Etna destroyed, their monstrous allies driven to the furthest corners of the earth, and yet Titans cannot die any more than we gods can. Whatever is left of Cronos is still alive in some hideous way, still conscious in his eternal pain, still hungering for power. He's healing, I said. He's coming back. Poseidon shook his head. From time to time over the aeons, Cronos has stirred. He enters men's nightmares and breathes evil thoughts. He wakens restless monsters from the depths, but to suggest he could rise from the pit is another thing. That's what he intends, father. That's what he said. Poseidon was silent for a long time. Lord Zeus has closed discussion on this matter. He will not allow talk of Cronos. You have completed your quest, child. That is all you need to do. But I stopped myself. Arguing would do no good. It would very possibly anger the only god who I had on my side. As, as you wish, father. A faint smile played on his lips. Obedience does not come naturally to you, does it? No, sir. I must take some blame for that, I suppose. The sea does not like to be restrained. He rose to his full height and took up his trident, and then he shimmered and became the size of a regular man, standing directly in front of me. You must go, child, but first know that your mother has returned. I stared at him, completely stunned. My mother? You will find her at home. Hades sent her when you recovered his helmet. Even the Lord of Death pays his debts. My heart was pounding. I couldn't believe it. Do you? Uh, would you? I wanted to ask if Poseidon would come with me to see her, but then I realised that was ridiculous. I imagined loading the god of the sea into a taxi and taking him to the Upper East Side. If he'd wanted to see my mum all those years, he could have, and there was smelly game to think about. Poseidon's eyes took on a little sadness. When you return home, Percy, you must make an important choice. You will find a package waiting in your room. A package? You will understand when you see it. No one can choose your path, Percy. You must decide. I nodded, though I didn't know what he meant. Your mother is a queen among women, Poseidon said wistfully. I had not met such a mortal woman in a thousand years. Still, I am sorry you were born, child. I have brought you a hero's fate, and a hero's fate is never happy. It is never anything but tragic. I tried not to feel hurt. Here was my own dad telling me he was sorry I'd been born. I don't mind, father. Not yet, perhaps, he said. Not yet, but it was an unforgivable mistake on my part. I'll leave you then. I bowed awkwardly. I, I won't bother you again. I was five steps away when he called Perseus. I turned. There was a different light in his eyes, a fiery kind of pride. You did well, Perseus. Do not misunderstand me. Whatever else you do, know that you are mine. You are a true son of the sea god. As I walked back through the city of the gods, conversation stopped. The muses paused their concert. People and satyrs and naiads all turned towards me, their faces filled with respect and gratitude, and as I passed they knelt, as if I was some kind of hero. Fifteen minutes later, still in a trance, I was back on the streets of Manhattan. I caught a taxi to my mum's apartment, rang the doorbell, and there she was, my beautiful mother, smelling of peppermint and licorice, the weariness and worry evaporating from her face as soon as she saw me. Percy! Oh, thank goodness! Oh, my baby! She crushed the air right out of me. We stood in the hallway as she cried and ran her hands through my hair. I'll admit it, my eyes were a little misty too. I was shaking. I was so relieved to see her. She told me she'd just appeared at the apartment that morning, scaring Gabe half out of his wits. 
She didn't remember anything since the minor tour and couldn't believe it when Gabe told her I was a wanted criminal, travelling across the country, blowing up national monuments. She'd been going out of her mind with worry all day because she hadn't heard the news. Gabe had forced her to go into work, saying she had a month's salary to make up and she'd better get started. I swallowed back my anger and told her my own story. I tried to make it sound less scary than it had been, but that wasn't easy. I was just getting to the fight with Ares when Gabe's voice interrupted from the living room. Hey Sally, that me loaf done yet or what? She closed her eyes. He isn't going to be happy to see you, Percy. The store got half a million phone calls today from Los Angeles. Something about three appliances? Oh yeah, about that. She managed a weak smile. Just don't make him angrier, all right? Come on. In the month I'd been gone, the apartment had turned into Gabe land. Garbage was ankle deep in the carpet. The sofa had been re-upholstered in beer cans. Dirty socks and underwear hung off the lampshades. Gabe and three of his big goony friends were playing poker at the table. When Gabe saw me, his cigar dropped out of his mouth. His face got redder than lava. You got nerve coming here, you little punk. I thought the police... He's not a fugitive after all, my mum interjected. Isn't that wonderful, Gabe? Gabe looked back and forth between us. He didn't seem to think my homecoming was so wonderful. Bad enough I had to give back your life insurance money, Sally, he growled. Get me the phone. I'll call the cops. Gabe, no. He raised his eyebrows. Did you just say no? You think I'm going to put up with this punk again? I can still press charges against him for ruining my Camaro. But he raised his hand and my mother flinched. For the first time, I realized something. Gabe had hit my mother. I didn't know when or how much, but I was sure he'd done it. Maybe it had been going on for years when I wasn't around. A balloon of anger started expanding in my chest. I came towards Gabe, instinctively taking my pen out of my pocket. He just sighed. What, punk? You're going to write on me. You touch me and you're going to, going to jail forever. You understand? Hey, Gabe. His friend Eddie interrupted. He's just a kid. Gabe looked at him resentfully and mimicked in a falsetto voice. He's just a kid. His other friends laughed like idiots. I'll be nice to you, punk. Gabe showed me his tobacco-stained teeth. I'll give you five minutes to get your stuff and clear out. After that, I call the police. Gabe, my mother pleaded. He ran away, Gabe told her. Let him stay gone. I was itching to uncap Riptide, but even if I did, the blade wouldn't hurt humans. And Gabe, by the loosest definition, was human. My mother took my arm. Please, Percy, come on. We'll go to your room. I let her pull me away, my hands still trembling with rage. My room had been completely filled with Gabe's junk. There were stacks of used car batteries, a rotting bouquet of sympathy flowers, with a card from somebody who'd seen his Barbara Walters interview. Gabe is just upset, honey, my mother told me. I'll talk to him later. I'm sure it will work out. Mum, it'll never work out. Not as long as Gabe's here. She wrung her hands nervously. I can... I'll take you to work with me uh, for the rest of the summer. In the autumn, maybe there's... There, maybe there's another boarding school. Mum... She lowered her eyes. I'm trying, Percy. I just, I need some time. A package appeared on my bed. At least, I could have sworn it hadn't been there a moment before. It was a battered cardboard box, about the right size to fit a basketball. This address on the mailing slip was in my own handwriting. The Gods, Mount Olympus, 600th floor, Empire State Building, New York, New York. With best wishes, Percy Jackson. Over the top in black marker, in a man's clear, bold print, was the address of our apartment and the words... Return to sender. Suddenly I, under I understood what Poseidon had told me on Olympus. A package. A decision. Whatever else you do, know that you are mine. You are a true son of the sea god. I looked at my mother. Mum, do you want Gabe gone? Percy, it, it isn't that simple. I... Mum, just tell me. That jerk has been hitting you. Do you want him gone or not? She hesitated and then nodded almost imperceptibly. Yes, Percy, I do. And I'm trying to get up my courage to tell him, but... You can't do this for me. You can't solve my problems. I looked at the box. I could solve her problem. I wanted to slice that package open, plop it on the poker table and take out what was inside. I could start by my very own statue garden right there in the living room. That's what a Greek hero would do in the stories, I thought. That's what Gabe deserves. But a hero's story always ended in tragedy. Poseidon had told me that. I remembered the underworld. I thought about Gabe's spirit drifting forever in the fields of Asphodel or condemned to some hideous torture behind the barbed wire of the fields of punishment, an eternal poker game, sitting up to his waist in boiling oil listening to opera music. Did I have the right to send someone there? Even Gabe? A month ago, I would have hesitated. Now, I can do it, I told my mum. One look inside this box and he'll never bother you again. 
She glanced at the package and seemed to understand immediately. No, Percy, she said, stepping away. You can't. Poseidon called you a queen, I told her. He said he hadn't met a woman like you in a thousand years. Her cheeks flushed. Percy, you deserve better than this, Mum. You should go to college, get your degree. You can write your novel, meet a nice guy, maybe. Live in a nice house. You don't need to protect me any more by staying with Gabe. Let me get rid of him. She wiped a tear off her cheek. You sound so much like your father, she said. He offered to stop the tide for me once. He offered to build me a palace at the bottom of the sea. He thought he could solve all my problems with a wave of his hand. What's wrong with that? Her multicoloured eyes seemed to search inside me. I think you know, Percy. I think you're enough like me to understand. If my life is going to mean anything, I have to live it myself. I can't let a god take care of me or my son. I have to find the courage on my own. Your quest has reminded me of that. We listened to the sound of poker chips swearing in ESPN from the living room television. I'll leave the box, I said, if he threatens you. She looked pale, but she nodded. Where will you go, Percy? Half-Blood Hill? For the summer or, or forever? I guess that depends. We locked eyes and I sensed that we had an agreement. We would see how things stood at the end of the summer. She kissed my forehead. You'll be a hero, Percy. You'll be the greatest of all. I took one last look around my bedroom. I had a feeling I'd never see it again. And then I walked with my mother to the front door. Leaving so soon, punk, Gabe called after me. Good riddance. I had one last twinge of doubt. How could I turn down the perfect chance to take revenge on him? I was leaving here without any saving, without saving my mother. Hey, Sally, he yelled. What about that meatloaf, huh? A steely look of anger flared in my mother's eyes. And I thought just maybe I was leaving her in good hands after all. Her own. The meatloaf is coming right up, dear, she told Gabe. Meatloaf? Surprise! She looked at me and winked. The last thing I saw as the door swung closed was my mother staring at Gabe as if she were contemplating how he would look as a garden statue. Chapter 22. The Prophecy Comes True. We were the first heroes to return alive to Half-Blood Hill since Luke, so of course everybody treated us as if we'd won some reality TV contest. According to camp tradition, we wore laurel wreaths to a big feast prepared in our honour, then led a procession down to the bonfire where we got to burn the burial shrouds our cabins had made for us in our absence. Annabeth's shroud was so beautiful, grey silk with embroidered owls. I told her it seemed a shame not to bury her in it. She punched me and told me to shut up. Being the son of Poseidon, I didn't have any cabin mates, so the Ares cabin had volunteered to make my shroud. They'd taken an old bedsheet and painted smiley faces with X'd out eyes around the border, and the word loser painted really big in the middle. It was fun to burn. As Apollo's cabin led the sing-along and passed out toasted marshmallows, I was surrounded by my old Hermes cabin mates, Annabeth's friends from Athena and Grover's satyr buddies, who were admiring the brand new searcher's license he'd received from the Council of Cloven Elders. The council had called Grover's performance on the quest brave to the point of indigestion, horns and whiskers above anything we have seen in the past. The only ones not in a party mood were Clarice and her cabin mates, whose poisonous looks told me they'd never forgive me for disgracing their dad. That was okay with me. Even Dionysus's welcome home speech wasn't enough to dampen my spirits. Yes, yes, so the little brat didn't get himself killed, and now he'll have an even bigger head. Well, huzzah for that. In other announcements, there will be no canoe races this Saturday. I moved back into cabin three, but it didn't feel so lonely anymore. I had my friends to train with during the day. At night, I lay awake and listened to the sea, knowing my father was out there. Maybe he wasn't quite sure about me yet. Maybe he hadn't even wanted me born, but he was watching. And so far, he was proud of what I'd done. As for my mother, she had a chance at a new life. Her letter arrived a week after I'd got back to camp. She told me Gabe had left mysteriously, disappeared off, disappeared off the face of the planet. In fact, she'd reported him missing to the police, but she had a funny feeling they would never find him. On a completely unrelated note, she'd sold her first life-size concrete sculpture entitled The Poker Player to a collector through an art gallery in Soho. She'd got so much money for it, she'd put a deposit down on a new apartment and made a payment on her first term's tuition at NYU. The Soho gallery was clamouring for more of her work, which they called a huge step forward in super ugly neorealism. But don't worry, my mum wrote, I'm done with sculpture. I've disposed of that box of tools you left me. It's time for me to turn to writing. At the bottom, she wrote a PS. Percy, I found a good private school here in the city. I've put a deposit down to hold you a spot in case you want to enrol for seventh grade. You could live at home. 
But if you want to go year round at Half Blood Hill, I'll understand. I folded the note carefully and set it on my bedside table. Every night before I went to sleep, I read it again and I tried to decide how to answer her. On the 4th of July, the whole camp gathered at the beach for a fireworks display by Cabin 9. Being Hephaestus's kids, they weren't going to settle for a few lame red, white and blue explosions. They'd anchored a barge offshore and loaded it with rockets the size of Patriot missiles. According to Annabeth, who'd seen the show before, the blasts would be sequenced so tightly they'd look like frames of animation across the sky. The finale was supposed to be a couple of 30 metre tall Spartan warriors who would crackle to life above the ocean, fight a battle and then explode into a million colours. As Annabeth and I were spreading a picnic blanket, Grover showed up to tell us goodbye. He was dressed in his usual jeans and t-shirt and trainers, but in the last few weeks he'd started to look older, almost high school age. His goatee had got thicker, he'd put on weight, his horns had grown a few centimetres at least, so he now had to wear his raster cap all the time to pass as a human. I'm off, he said. I just came to say, well, you know. I tried to feel happy for him. After all, it wasn't every day a satyr got permission to go look for the great god Pan. But it was hard saying goodbye. I'd only known Grover a year, yet he was my oldest friend. Annabeth gave him a hug. She told him to keep his fake feet on. I asked him where he was going to search first. Kind of a secret, he said, looking embarrassed. I wish you could come with me, guys. But humans and Pan, we understand, Annabeth said. You got enough tin cans for the trip? Yeah. And you remembered your reed pipes. Geez, Annabeth, he grumbled. You're like an old mama goat. But he didn't really sound annoyed. He gripped his walking stick and slung a backpack over his shoulder. He looked like any hitchhiker you might see on an American highway. Nothing like the little runty boy I used to defend from bullies at Yancey Academy. Well, he said, wish me luck. He gave Annabeth another hug. He clapped me on the shoulder and then headed back through the dunes. Fireworks exploded to life overhead. Hercules killing the Nemean lion. Artemis chasing the boar, George Washington, who, by the way, was a son of Athena, crossing the Delaware. Hey, Grover, I called. He turned at the edge of the woods. Wherever you're going, I hope they make good enchiladas. Grover grinned, and then he was gone, the trees closing around him. We'll see him again, Annabeth said. I tried to believe it. The fact that no searcher had ever come back in 2,000 years, well, I decided not to think about that. Grover would be, would be the first. He had to be. July passed. I spent my days devising new strategies for capture the flag and making alliances with the other cabins to keep the banner out of Ares' hands. I got to the top of the climbing wall for the first time without getting scorched by lava. From time to time I'd walk past the big house, glance up at the attic windows and think about the oracle. I tried to convince myself that its prophecy had come to completion. You shall go west and face the god who has turned. Been there, done that, even though the traitor god had turned out to be Ares rather than Hades. You shall find what was stolen and see it safely returned. Check. One master bolt delivered. One helmet of darkness back on Hades' oily head. You shall be betrayed by one who calls you a friend. This line still bothered me. Ares had pretended to be my friend and then betrayed me. That must be what the oracle meant. And you shall fail to save what matters most in the end. I had fa failed to save my mum, but only because I'd let her save herself. And I knew that was the right thing. So why was I still uneasy? The last night of the summer session came all too quickly. The campers had one last meal together. We burned part of a, our dinner for the gods. At the bonfire, the senior councillors awarded the end of summer beads. I got my own leather necklace, and when I saw the bead for my first summer, I was glad the firelight covered my blushing. The design was pitch black, with a sea green trident shimmering in the centre. The choice was unanimous, Luke announced. This bead commemorates the first son of the sea god at this camp, and the quest he undertook into the darkest part of the underworld to stop a war. The entire camp got to their feet and cheered. Even Ares' cabin felt obliged to stand. Athena's cabin steered Annabeth to the front so she could share in the applause. I'm not sure I'd ever felt as happy or sad as I did at that moment. I'd finally found a family, people who cared about me and thought I'd done something right. And in the morning, most of them would be leaving for the year. The next morning, I found a form letter on my bedside table. I knew Dionysus must have filled it out because he stubbornly insisted on getting my name wrong. Dear Peter Johnson, if you intend to stay at Camp, Camp Half-Blood year round, you must inform the big house by noon today. If you do not announce your intentions, we will assume you have vacated your cabin or died a horrible death. Cleaning harpies will begin work at sundown. 
they will be authorised to eat any unregistered campers. All personal articles left behind will be incinerated in the lava pit. Have a nice day, Mr D. Dionysus, Camp Director, Olympian Council No. 12. That's another thing about ADHD. Deadlines just aren't real to me until I'm staring one in the face. Summer was over and I still hadn't answered my mother or the camp about whether I'd be staying. Now I only had a few hours to decide. The decision should have been easy. I mean, nine months of hero training or nine months of sitting in a classroom. Duh. But there, were, there was my mum to consider. For the first time, I had the chance to live with her for a whole year without Gabe. I had a chance to be at home and knock around the city in my free time. I remembered what Annabeth had said so long ago on our quest. The real world is where the monsters are. That's where you learn whether you're any good or not. I thought about the fate of Thalia, daughter of Zeus. I wondered how many monsters would attack me if I left Half-Blood Hill, if I stayed in one place for a whole school year, without Chiron or my friends around to help me. Would my mother and I even survive until next summer? That was assuming the spelling tests and five paragraph essays didn't kill me. But I decided I'd go down to the arena and do some sword practice. Maybe that would clear my head. The campgrounds were mostly deserted, shimmering in the August heat. All the campers were in their cabins, packing up, or running around with brooms and mops, getting ready for final inspection. Argus was helping some of the Aphrodite kids haul their Gucci suitcases and makeup kits over the hill where the camp's shuttle bus would be waiting to take them to the airport. Don't think about leaving yet, I told myself. Just train. I got to the Sword Fighters arena and found that Luke had had the same idea. His gym bag was plopped at the edge of the stage. He was working solo, whacking away at battle dummies with a sword I'd never seen before. It must have been a regular steel blade, because he was slashing the dummies' heads right off, stabbing through their straw-stuffed guts. His orange councillor's shirt was dripping with sweat. His expression was so intense. His life must have really been in danger. I watched, fascinated, as he disemboweled the whole row of dummies, hacking off limbs and basically reducing them to a pile of straw and armour. They were only dummies, but I still couldn't help being awed by Luke's skill. The guy was an incredible fighter. It made me wonder again how he possibly could have failed at his quest. Finally, he saw me and stopped mid-swing. Percy. Um, sorry, I said, embarrassed. I, I just... It's okay, he said, lowering his sword. Just doing some last-minute practice. Those tummies won't be bothering anybody anymore. Luke shrugged. We build new ones every summer. Now that his sword wasn't swirling around, I could see something odd about it. The blade was two different types of metal. One edge bronze the other steel. Luke noticed me looking at it. Oh, this <laughs> new toy. This is Backbiter. Backbiter. Luke turned the blade in the light so it glinted wickedly. One side is celestial bronze. The other is tempered steel. Works on mortals and immortals both. I thought about what Chiron had told me when I started my quest, that a hero should never harm mortals unless absolutely necessary. I didn't know they could make weapons like that. They Probably can't, Luke agreed. It's one of a kind. He gave me a tiny smile and then slid the sword into its scabbard. Listen, I was going to come looking for you. What do you say we go down to the woods one last time, look for something to fight? I don't know why I hesitated. I should have felt relieved that Luke was being so friendly. Ever since I got back from the quest, he'd been acting a little distant. I was afraid he might resent me for all the attention I'd had. You think it's a good idea? I asked. I mean, oh, come on. He rummaged in his gym bag and pulled out a six-pack of Cokes. Drinks on me? I stared at the Cokes, wondering where the heck he'd got them. There was no regular mortal sodas at the camp store. No way to smuggle them in, unless you talk to a satyr, maybe. Of course, the magic dinner goblets would fill with anything you want, but it just didn't taste the same as a real Coke. Straight out of the can. Sugar and caffeine. My willpower crumbled. Sure, I decided. Why not? We walked down to the woods and kicked around for some kind of monster to fight, but it was too hot. All the monsters, with any sense, must have been taking siestas in their nice cool caves. We found a shady spot by the creek where I'd broken Clarice's spear during my first Capture the Flag game. We sat on a big rock, drank our cokes, and watched the sunlight in the woods. After a while, Luke said, You miss being on a quest? With monsters attacking me every metre? Are you kidding? Luke raised an eyebrow. Yeah, I miss it, I admitted. You? A shadow passed over his face. I was used to hearing from the girls how good-looking Luke was, but at that moment he looked weary and angry and not at all handsome. His blonde hair was grey in the sunlight. The scar on his face looked deeper than usual. I could imagine him as an old man. 
I've lived at Half-Blood Hill year-round since I was 14, he told me. Ever since failure. Well, you know. I trained and trained and trained. I never got to be a normal teenager out there in the real world. And then they threw me one quest. And when I came back, it was like, OK, ride's over. Have a nice life. He crumpled his Coke can and threw it into the creek, which really shocked me. One of the first things you learn at Camp Half-Blood is don't litter. You'll hear from the nymphs and the naiads. They'll get even. You'll crawl into bed one night and find your sheets filled with centipedes and mud. The heck with laurel reefs, Luke said. I'm not going to end up like those dusty trophies in the big house attic. You make it sound like you're leaving. Luke gave me a twisted smile. Oh, I'm leaving, all right, Percy. I brought you down here to say goodbye. He snapped his fingers. A small fire burned a hole in the ground at my feet. Out crawled something glistening black, about the size of my hand. A scorpion. I started to go for my pen. I wouldn't, Luke cautioned. Pit scorpions can jump up to five metres. Its stinger can pierce right through your clothes. You'd be dead in 60 seconds. Luke, what? And then it hit me. You will be betrayed by one who calls you a friend. You, I said. He stood calmly and brushed off his jeans. The scorpion paid him no attention. It kept its beady black eyes on me, clamping its pincers as it crawled onto my shoe. I saw a lot out there in the world, Percy, Luke said. Didn't you feel it? The darkness gathering, the monsters growing stronger. Didn't you realise how useless it all is? All the heroics being pawns of the gods. They should have been overthrown thousands of years ago, but they've hung on, thanks to us half-bloods. I couldn't believe this was happening. Luke, you're talking about our parents, I said. He laughed. That's supposed to make me love them. Their precious Western civilization is a disease, Percy. It's killing the world. The only way to stop it is to burn it to the ground, start over with something more honest. You're as crazy as Ares. His eyes flared. Ares is a fool. He never realized the true master he was serving. If I had time, Percy, I could explain. But I'm afraid you won't live that long. The scorpion crawled onto my trouser leg. There had to be a way out of this. I needed time to think. Kronos, I said. That's who you serve. The air got colder. You should be careful with names, Luke warned. Kronos got you to steal the master bolt and the helmet. He spoke to you in your dreams. Luke's eye twitched. He spoke to you too, Percy. You should have listened. He's brainwashing you, Luke. You're wrong. He showed me what my talents are being wasted. You know what my quest was two years ago, Percy. My father, Hermes, wanted me to steal a golden apple from the garden of the Hesperides and return it to Olympus. After all the training I'd done, that was the best he could think up. That's not an easy quest, I said. Hercules did it. Exactly, Luke said. Where's the glory in repeating what others have done? All the gods know how to do is repay their past. My heart wasn't in it. The dragon in the garden gave me this. He pointed angrily at his scar. And when I came back, all I got was pity. I wanted to pull Olympus down stone by stone right then, but I bided my time. I began to dream of Kronos. He convinced me to steal something worthwhile, something no hero had ever had the courage to take. When we went on that winter solstice field trip, while the other campers were asleep, I sneaked into the throne room and took Zeus's master bolt right from his chair. Hades' helmet of darkness, too. You wouldn't believe how easy it was. The Olympians are so arrogant. They never dreamed someone could dare steal from them. Their security is horrible. I was halfway across New Jersey before I heard the storms rumbling, and I knew they discovered my theft. The scorpion was sitting on my knee now, staring at me with its glittering eyes. I tried to keep my voice level. So, why didn't you bring the items to Kronos? Luke's smile wavered. I... I got overconfident. Zeus sent out his sons and daughters to find the stolen bolt. Artemis, Apollo, my father, Hermes. But it was Ares who caught me. I could have beaten him, but I wasn't careful enough. He disarmed me, took the items of power, threatened to return them to Olympus and burn me alive. And then Cross's voice came to me and, I told, and told me what to say. I put the idea in Ares' head about a great war between the gods. I said all he had to do was hide the items away for a while and watch the others fight. Ares got a wicked gleam in his eyes. I knew he was hooked. He let me go and I returned the Olymp to Olympus before anyone noticed my absence. Luke drew his sword. He ran his thumb down the flat of the blade as if he were hypnotised by its beauty. Afterwards... The Lord of the Titans. He, he punished me with nightmares. I swore not to fail again. Back at Camp, camp Half-Blood, in my dreams, 
I was told that a second hero would arrive. One who could be tricked into taking the bolt and the helmet the rest of the way, from Ares down to Tartarus. You summoned the Hellhound that night in the forest. We had to make Chiron think the camp wasn't safe for you, so he could start. He would start you on your quest. We had to confirm his fears that Hades was after you. And it worked. The flying shoes were cursed, I said. They were supposed to drag me and the backpack into Tartarus. And they would have if you'd been wearing them. But you gave them to the satyr, which wasn't part of the plan. Grover messes up everything he touches. He even confused the curse. Luke looked down at the scorpion, which was now sitting on my thigh. You should have died in Tartarus, Percy. But don't worry. I'll leave you with my little friend to set things right. Thalia gave her life to save you, I said, gritting my teeth. And this is how you repay her. Don't speak of Thalia, he shouted. The gods let her die. That's one of the many things they will pay for. You're being used, Luke. You and Ares both. Don't listen to Kronos. I've been used. <laughs> Luke's voice for it turned shrill. Look at yourself. What has your dad ever done for you? Kronos will rise. <laughs> You've only delayed his plans. He will cast the Olympians into Tartarus and drive humanity back to their caves, all except the strongest, the ones who serve him. Call off the bug, I said. If you're so strong, fight me yourself. Luke smiled. A nice try, Percy, but I'm not Ares. You can't bait me. My lord is waiting, and he's got plenty of quests for me to undertake. Luke, goodbye, Percy. There is a new golden age coming. You won't be part of it. He slashed his sword in an arc and disappeared in a ripple of darkness. The scorpion lunged. I swatted it away with my hand and uncapped my sword. The thing jumped at me and I cut it in half in mid-air. I was about to congra congratulate myself until I looked down at my hand. My palm had a huge red welt, oozing and smoking with yellow guck. The thing had got me after all. My ears pounded. My vision went foggy. The water, I thought. It had healed me before. I stumbled to the creek and submerged my hand, but nothing seemed to happen. The poison was too strong. My vision was getting dark. I could barely stand up. Sixty seconds, Luke had told me. I had to get back to camp. If I collapsed out here, my body would be dinner for a monster. Nobody would ever know what had happened. My legs felt like lead. My forehead was burning. I stumbled towards the camp, and the nymphs stirred from their trees. Help! I croaked. Please! Two of them took my arms, pulling me along. I remember making it to a clearing, a counsellor shouting for help, a centaur blowing a conch horn, and then everything went black. I woke with a drinking straw in my mouth. I was sipping something that tasted like liquid chocolate chip cookies. Nectar. I opened my eyes. I was propped up in bed in the sick room of the big house, my right hand bandaged like a club. Argus stood guard in the corner. Annabeth sat next to me, holding my nectar glass and dabbing a washcloth on my forehead. Here we are again, I said. You idiot, Annabeth said, which is how I knew she was overjoyed to see me conscious. You were green and turning grey when we found you. If it weren't for Chiron's healing... Now, now, Chiron's voice said. Percy's constitution deserves some of the credit. He was sitting near the foot of my bed in human form, which was why I hadn't noticed him yet. His lower half was magically compacted into the wheelchair, his upper half dressed in a coat and tie. He smiled, but his face looked weary and pale the way it did when he'd been up all night grading Latin papers. How are you feeling? he asked. Like my insides have been frozen and then microwaved. Apt, considering that was pit scorpion venom. Now you must tell me if you can exactly what happened. Between sips of nectar, I told them the story. The room was quiet for a long time. I can't believe that. That Luke, Annabeth's voice faltered. Her expression turned angry and sad. Yes, yes, I can believe it. Maybe the gods curse him. He was never the same after his quest. This must be reported to Olympus, Chiron murmured. I will go at once. Luke is out there right now, I said. I have to go after him. Chiron shook his head. No, Percy. The gods won't even talk about Kronos, I snapped. Zeus declared the matter closed. Percy, I know this is hard, but you must not rush out for vengeance. You aren't ready. I didn't like it, but part of me suspected Chiron was right. One look at my hand and I knew I wasn't going to be sword fighting any time soon. Chiron, your prophecy from the Oracle. It was about Kronos, wasn't it? Was I in it and Annabeth? Chiron glanced nervously at the ceiling. Percy, it isn't my place. You've been ordered not to talk about me, to talk to me about it, haven't you? His eyes were sympathetic but sad. You will be the great hero. 
a great hero, child. I will do my best to prepare you, but if I'm right about the path ahead of you... Thunder boomed overhead, rattling the windows. All right, Chiron shouted. Fine! He sighed in frustration. The gods have their reasons, Percy. Knowing too much of your future is never a good thing. We can't just sit back and do nothing, I said. We will not sit back, Chiron promised, but you must be careful. Kronos wants you to come unraveled. He wants your life disrupted, your thoughts clouded with fear and anger. Do not give him what he wants. Train patiently. Your time will come. Assuming I live that long. Chiron put his hand on my ankle. You'll have to trust me, Percy. You will live. Be first, but first you must decide your path for the coming year. I cannot tell you the right choice. I got the feeling that he had a very, very definite opinion, and it was talking, taking all his willpower not to advise me. But you must decide whether to stay at Camp Half-Blood year-round or return to the mortal world for seventh grade and be a summer camper. Think on that. When I get back from Olympus, you must tell me your decision. I wanted to protest. I wanted to ask him more questions, but his expression told me there could be no more discussion. He had said as much as he could. I'll be back as soon as I can, Chiron promised. Argus will watch over you. He looked at Annabeth. Oh, and my dear, whenever you're ready, they're here. Who's here? I asked. Nobody answered. Chiron rolled himself out of the room. I heard the wheels of his clad clunk carefully down the front steps, two at a time. Annabeth studied the ice in my drink. What's wrong? I asked her. Nothing. She set the glass on the table. I, I just took your advice about something. You, um, you need anything? Yeah, help me up. I want to go outside. Percy, this isn't a good idea. I slid my legs out of bed. Annabeth caught me before I could crumple to the floor. A wave of nausea rolled over me. Annabeth said, I told you, I'm fine, I insisted. I didn't want to lie in bed like an invalid while Luke was out there planning to destroy the Western world. I managed to step forward and then another still leaning heavily on Annabeth. Argus followed us outside, but he kept his distance. By the time we reached the porch, my face was beaded with sweat. My stomach had twisted into knots, but I had to manage it to make it all the way to the railing. It was dusk. The camp looked completely deserted. The cabins were dark and the volleyball pit silent. No canoes cut the surface of the lake. Beyond the woods and the strawberry fields, the Long Island sound glittered in the last, last light of the sun. What are you going to do? Annabeth asked me. I don't know. I told her I got the feeling Chiron wanted me to stay year round, to put in more individual training time, but I wasn't sure that's what I wanted. I admitted I'd feel bad about leaving her alone, though, with only Clarice for company. Annabeth pursed her lips and then said quietly, I'm going home for the year, Percy. I stared at her. You mean... To your dad's. She pointed towards the crest of Half-Blood Hill, next to Thalia's pine tree, at the very edge of the camp's magical boundaries. Her family stood silhouetted. Two little children, a woman and a tall man with blonde hair. They seemed to be waiting. The man was holding a backpack that looked like the one Annabeth had got from Waterland in Denver. I wrote him a letter when we got back, Annabeth said, just like you, suggest like, like you suggested. I told him. I was sorry. I'd come home for the school year if he still wanted me. He wrote back immediately. We decided we'd give it another try. That took guts. She pursed her lips. You won't try anything stupid during the school year, will you? At least not without sending me an iris message. I managed a smile. I won't go looking for trouble. I usually don't have to. When I get back next summer, she said, we'll hunt down Luke. We'll ask for a quest. But if we don't get approval, we'll sneak off and do it anyway. Agreed? Sounds like a plan worthy of Athena. She held out her hand. I shook it. Take care, seaweed brain, Annabeth told me. Keep your eyes open. You too, wise girl. I watched her walk up the hill and join her family. She gave her father an awkward hug and looked back at the valley one last time. She touched Falia's pine tree and then allowed herself to be led over the crest and into the mortal world. For the first time at camp, I felt truly alone. I looked out at Long Island Sound and I remembered my father saying, the sea does not like to be restrained. I made my decision. I wondered if Poseidon were watching, would he approve of my choice? I'll be back next summer, I promised him. I'll survive until then. After all, I am your son. I asked Argus to take me down to cabin three so I could pack my bags for home. The End And that is the end of Percy Jackson and the Lightning Thief by Rick Riordan. Really hope you enjoyed that story, guys. I will be back soon with the next Percy Jackson story. 
Percy Jackson and the Sea of Monsters, and lots more stories coming your way on this channel. Hope you like this one, guys. Thanks for listening. Thanks for all your support, as always. Take care. Bye-bye.